We're about to discuss one of those gigantic rumors that may be completely false, but if it's true, it would be so hugely impactful that we basically have to consider the possibility. It's a little bit about the government picking winners and losers, but it's more about an administration so hell-bent on crippling an industry that it's willing to go after the biggest exchange in all of crypto and take out a few banks along the way. True or not, we're going to talk about the biggest conspiracy theory of this crypto bear market. Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to discuss the gigantic conspiracy theory and what it would mean if it were true, things looking very rough at one of the biggest banks in the world, Gensler reasserting that proof-of-stake tokens are securities, more on Cardano governance, and a startup of sorts that's already been launched with GPT-4 as the CEO and founder. If you think the most disturbing part of this image is not that the bear made his own tinfoil hat, but that he did so in his own workshop, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. Why am I showing you a bear wearing a tinfoil hat? Because this is a bear market and we're going to talk about a giant conspiracy theory. So what is this conspiracy theory? Before we jump into that, be aware, this is just a rumor. Who knows if it's true or false? Who knows if it's if it even has a small probability of being true? But I think it's interesting and it's worth considering. I think it would be so impactful, it's worth considering. So don't take any financial action. Don't take don't do anything based on this rumor. But I think it's interesting to think about. This poster says, here's my one and final take. I'm actually repeating myself. SBF went into custody in early December. The DOJ warned before Christmas that they were coming for CZ. Binance is so large, the contagion from direct law enforcement action would collapse the US financial system. So there's a lot going on in just this initial post. This is going to be a thread, but there's a lot going on here. So let's break this down a little bit. SBF went into US custody. Okay, yeah, that did happen. The DOJ warned before Christmas that they were coming for CZ. Okay, there were a lot of articles implying that U.S. authorities were investigating Binance, and I think there might have even Binance might have even commented on it themselves, you know. But it always gets a little ambiguous because all the exchanges sort of have to work with you know U.S. legal authorities. So a lot of times when they're when um, journalists are describing interaction between an exchange and and law enforcement um it, it it's a little bit unclear because the exchange is sort of working with law enforcement at all times because they have to help law enforcement to curb things like money laundering by you know unpleasant undesirable parties so they're constantly working with law enforcement that but then there's this other thing that happens when the law enforcement is actually investigating the exchange and they start asking the exchange questions and there was definitely an implication that that had been going on for some time with binance the next statement binance is so large the contagion from direct law enforcement action would collapse the u.s financial system i don't know if this is <laughs> entirely true and i don't know if anyone could really say what the impact of the contagion from Binance being shut down would be. If Binance were shut down by the Department of Justice tomorrow, how far and how deeply would the cont contagion spread? How deeply would that cut the US financial system? I don't think anybody really knows. There are too many too many possible intervening events, you know, it's unclear who has what money in Binance and where Binance has its money too many things to guess how how deeply the contagion would affect the US financial system. But let's say there would be some impact. Let's just assume there's some impact and you can decide for yourself at home how much impact you think that would be. But the important thing is, I think we'd all agree, there would be an impact. The, there would be an impact by taking down an exchange so large, the very largest exchange in all of crypto. And when we say that, we have to be clear. I don't think there's a there's not a there's not an entity in crypto larger than Binance. When we say it's the largest centralized exchange or the largest exchange, really what we're saying is it's the biggest entity in all of crypto. Next post says SVP, SVB, and Silvergate create a moat. So now he's describing sort of like um, 
how this conspiracy would work. SVB and Silvergate create a moat around the U.S. banking system between it and crypto. The DOJ can now take down Binance with minimal impact on grandma. SVB was used to launder money from Russia, China and Russia. This is long since known. So um, I'll, I'll, I, I don't know about this last statement, and I don't think it's really that important for this discussion. But the first two, SVB and Silvergate create a moat around the U.S. banking system between it and crypto. Obviously, Coinbase and Kraken still have fiat on ramps and off ramps. If they didn't, they would have had to sort of cease operations. No new money would be able to come in or out of crypto. There are other on ramps and off ramps, but it would have been a huge, huge move if there was a complete moat around the US banking system. So there are other banking relationships to be had, but I think it is fair to say Silvergate and SVB and Signature were the three largest crypto facing banks. So if you were trying to create a moat around the US banking system, create an air gap between the US banking system and crypto, I mean, you pretty much just want to take out the biggest bridges. And that sort of happened over the last week or two through through banking failures. But as we'll talk about, as we talked about yesterday, and we'll talk about again tonight, it's kind of questionable whether or not Signature really needed to be shut down. Uh, Barney Frank has been sort of asking the question, hey, the regulator who took us down, who shut us down, never, never accused us of being insolvent. They never said we were insolvent. So is this the first shutdown of a bank in US history that wasn't insolvent? And it does seem kind of convenient. These are the three biggest crypto facing banks. The DOJ can now take down Binance with minimal impact on grandma. So again, whatever you think would be the impact of Binance being shut down, and to whatever extent you think a moat or an air gap has been created between the fiat world and the crypto world, definitely some degree of those two things are true. So this, this statement, that the DOJ can now take down Binance with minimal impact on grandma, it is true to some extent. There is, they did decrease the impact on, you know, on the average American consumer, on the average US consumer, on the, the uh, prototypical grandma. Next, he says, be wary of those who claim the Fed should make non-insured depositors whole. They serve foreign interests, bought and paid for by enemies of the state. I don't, I don't know about this part. I don't think this is as important. But certainly, there were a lot of non-insured depositors who were extremely happy when their deposits beyond that 250k figure that's, that's insured by the FDIC, uh, when they found out that that uh, they were going to be insured. He says, being an enemy of the state is a tricky business. I think it would be fair to put CZ in that category. The feds, the U.S. feds, definitely seem to not be not be buddies with CZ right now. Maybe enemy of the state is a little extreme. Maybe that's a little little dramatic, but um, definitely he's not a best friend of the state right now. You can't be one and a billionaire. They will come for you. So that's definitely happening. With it seems like if if this if this theory were true, then that would definitely have been the case with Binance. If you're not used to playing the markets, okay, so now he's giving uh, financial advice. We don't need to go over that so much. But down here at the bottom, this is the important part. The largest competitor in the markets will vanish overnight. Then it will be open season for a new titan to rise. Brian Armstrong right now is like, and then they show the snapping of the fingers by, what's this guy's name? Thanos. Is that this guy's name? Thanos, the big purple guy. And he's got the uh, the glove of what's it called glove of destiny. I forget what this is called. It's been a long time since I've seen this movie, but I mean that's kind of true. If this were all to go down, Brian Armstrong gonna be pretty happy. And I don't think I don't think it's um I think Brian Armstrong made a very wise decision. He made a very wise decision during the last administration to register as a public company. Coinbase is a public company. So if the feds were to take down Coinbase, 
they would be taking down a registered US-based public company. That's the kind of thing that doesn't win you any votes. But if you spend, you know, six, 12 months painting Binance as a C CCP controlled crypto exchange and then being, you know, shadily tied up with uh, FTX, you know, or, you know, making some kind of shady move to precipitate the collapse of FTX, things like that. And then you constantly, you know, have journalists mentioning that CZ, even though he, grew up in Canada, you know, is also a native of China. It's a lot easier. That's a lot easier target for them to go after than a Coinbase. And it's actually a higher value target for them because it's the biggest crypto exchange. So what would happen? So Brian Armstrong seems to have made this brilliant choice. I don't think if Brian Armstrong tried to make Coinbase into a a public company today, I don't think he would be successful under this administration. That probably doesn't happen. He is probably denied, but he made a brilliant choice by doing it when he could. They became a public company when they could. And he said at the time, at the time they said, part of this is to make it harder for them to get rid of us. And it looks like Brian Armstrong made the brilliant choice. So now he is in the position of this giant purple guy with the unfortunate chin. I don't know. I don't know what's happened to this poor guy's chin, but he's not he's not gonna be a chin model. Brian Armstrong is in this position though. He uh he he now is, if this happens, it is equivalent to him snapping his fingers and having his biggest competitor, even larger than his company, sort of vanish overnight. I should point out that Coinbase's actual registration statement which you can see here was filed on February 25th, 2021, which was about a month after the current administration took office. But what I was saying was that obviously the decision to go public had been made during the prior administration. Here's what's interesting for Cardano. If we look at our market cap list, Cardano is in place number seven, Bitcoin and Ethereum are in place num places number one and two. In between us and them is nothing but regulatory turmoil. XRP, famously in this gigantic, super long case with the SEC, who knows what will happen there, but certainly it will impact the future of XRP. So XRP could, uh, could have a very different future if it wins or loses that case. Then you've got USDC. USDC just barely depegged because the authorities, as much as they seem to be after Binance, they also seem to be after stable coins, which is something we've talked about many times in this channel. Then you've got Binance, you've got BNB, the BNB coin. What happens to that coin if the authorities somehow figure out how to shut down the Binance exchange? I think we all know what happens here. So there's a whole lot of regulatory turmoil which could you know, shape the future of all, all of these assets, all uh, four of these assets. And they're the only ones standing between Cardano and Ethereum and Bitcoin. In that same thread, the author finishes up by pointing out what the CEO of BlackRock is saying. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink says the banking crisis could worsen beyond the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, worrying aloud about cracks in the financial system. What could he be talking about here? Well, everybody knows that BlackRock owns everything, including, coincidentally, 5% of one of the biggest banks in the entire world, Credit Suisse, which is 167 years old and which last year had assets under management of 1.29 trillion. That's trillion with a T. Things are not looking at all good for Credit Suisse. This post says, good morning, everyone. Credit Suisse stock plunges to all-time low, down 96.7% from all-time high. Credit spreads blowing up, and Saudi National Bank says they won't assist anymore. You might have noticed that the Saudi National Bank was also a, a holder of a significant percentage of Credit Suisse. But if you look at this chart, it kind of tells a story. People have been talking about the potential demise of Credit Suisse for a long time because it had this high of 61 53 $61 on April 30th, 2007. It's currently at $2 and almost four cents.
But then just a couple of hours ago, articles like this one from NBC started coming out saying that we don't have to worry about anything. The Swiss National Bank was going to bail them out to the tune of $54 billion. Is this, is this looking familiar to anybody who was around in 2008? We haven't heard from Uncle Gary Gensler in a while, but don't worry. It looks like he's still up to his old tricks. He uh, dropped this little quote to reporters. The investing public is investing, anticipating a return, anticipating something on these tokens, whether they're proof of stake tokens, where they're also looking to get returns on the, those proof of stake tokens and getting two, four, 18% returns, whatever they're promoting and putting into a protocol and locking up their tokens in a protocol, a protocol that's often a small group of entrepreneurs and developers are developing. I would just suggest that each of these token operators seek to come into compliance and the same with the intermediaries. So he's still signaling the exact same kind of language. He's sort of threatening both proof of stake tokens and he's kind of looks like he's kind of, you know, searching for the words to describe uh, DeFi protocols where you might be uh, locking up your tokens and getting some kind of return. But it looks like he just wants to threaten, you know, everything everything in crypto still. So it's going to be interesting. I think uh, there's enough, there are enough cases sort of in play right now. It's going to be interesting to see how much he's able to accomplish on his quest to crush crypto. I, I guess somehow in the hopes that that uh, makes him a shoe in for the secretary of the treasury spot that he seems to want so badly. Just realize they have dark mode so much better. When I look at a quote like this, I have to ask myself, is this just kind of like suppressing fire? Is he just trying to have a chilling effect on everyone in crypto who might be engaging in these types of activities? Or is he talking about what they're talking about currently inside the SEC because they're going after a project that does these things? So if it's that, if it's if he's actually talking about the next enforcement action we're going to see, I have to wonder, is it this first part or the second part? Because if it's the first part, it could be something as big, as gigantic as Ethereum 2.0. Could they be going after Ethereum staking? That would be a gigantic chunk for them to bite off. The SEC with their limited personnel, this is way bigger than XRP. This is, that would be gigantic. That would be a seismic attack on crypto. If it's the second part about locking up tokens in a protocol, this could be something much smaller. It could be a much, much more manageable DeFi platform, or it could be something as big as Lido, which is still much more manageable than going after all of Ethereum. All of Ethereum, you're basically declaring war on all of crypto. That's going to be gigantic. Go after Lido, a little bit more manageable. Charles dropped another video on governance today. Check this out. He's got a red screen on his mic matching Logan the lobster over here. This is this is getting this is getting pretty fancy. But this was another video on governance. And in this one Charles once again tried to reiterate to everybody that they're really trying to put together governance of the community by the community that there's no secret power grab here by IOG, that the founding entities aren't trying to retain their grasp on the reins or anything like that. And I think this is really true. I honestly, I've said this a few times already, but I honestly don't think we should be worried about the founding entities or IOG specifically trying to retain power. I think we should be worried about them exiting. What we should be worried about is that IOG hands the community over to the community and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, we as the community vote on the following, you know, the following work to be done in the community. And IOG is like, okay, sweet. Uh, who are you going to have to do that? Who's going to do that for you? And then all of a sudden it's like we have to go through this process of figuring out who's going to do all the dev work on the base layer, on anything else we want done. We should be worried about leaving this era when IOG is basically just doing this free work. And I know, I know you, people will always argue that they're, they're benefiting from the work because they own so much ADA and that's, that's certainly true, but we're, we're also basically getting free work out of them. A lot of free work, like almost all the work in the ecosystem besides the dApps and, you know, certain side chains, things like that. IOG has pretty much built this entire ecosystem. I think we should be much more concerned 
about them exiting and saying, oh, oh, you want a bunch of, you want the following things done? You guys all voted to do the following things? Okay, who, who are you going to have to do that? Uh, how much are you going to pay? You know what I mean? This is, people should be a lot more concerned about that than about IOG keeping a few seats on the Constitutional Committee. Finally, you should be aware that some people are already welcoming the reign of our new AI rulers. This guy told GPT-4 that it, it, he had a budget of 100 bucks and he was going to let GPT-4 decide how to make as much money as possible in the shortest time possible with that $100 without doing anything illegal. GPT-4 quickly decided they would make a, a an affiliate marketing site marketing content around eco-friendly and sustainable living products. It would be called greengadgetguru.com. Then GPT-4 set about to use Dolly, a, a Dolly prompt to make a logo that produced this logo over here. You might know that it's a common problem with Dolly, that the, uh, the graphics are good, but the text is messed up. So he just took the same logo design basically and manually created it in uh, Illustrator with the correct text over here. Then GPT-4 decided to start designing the website. And this, it, it created a prompt for their first content image cover. They made this in mid journey. looks pretty reasonable. Uh, GPT is actually citing real sustainable products in their first content piece. He describes those products here. GPT-4 then decided they would allocate $40 to Facebook and Instagram ads. Uh, he asked... Uh, GPT-4, if it wanted to uh, create a little content for this actual thread on Twitter, and GPT-4 got real quick on creating a bunch of sustainable living propaganda, producing this message right here. Very, uh, the uh, author describes it as, uh, not going to lie, the grift is real. GPT-4 seemed to have no moral qualms about selling the eco-conscious propaganda super hard. Then he started getting investors. Uh, somebody offered to give him $100 to invest in the enterprise. Uh, then GPD-4, he started asking it if it would be okay if he brought an advertiser into this thread. GPD-4 said, okay, great, but let's counter their offer. We got 900,000 uh, impressions on that tweet. So try to get them to pay $65. If the advertiser accepts, the promotion will bring additional funds to our venture. Uh, the author said DMs are flooded. He now had a $500 new investment along with the original $100 investment. And that was for 2% of the venture, which brought the valuation of their new startup to $25,000. Mind you, that was two about two hours ago. And this, this thread was made, uh, what, what are we at? Maybe like, um, eight hours prior to that. So this is all happening over the course of like eight ish hours, uh, 12 hours, something like that. Here's the, uh, advertisement they finally settled on. And I'm sure it's just going to go on and on and there are going to be more investors and the valuation of this crazy AI led startup is just going to increase and increase. I think this, uh, this post got 91,000 views. So not bad. They've gotten, they've gone from zero, no idea, and only a hundred dollars to a startup, which you can reasonably value at $25,000. We'll see where this goes, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people read this thread and just start doing the exact same thing. I hope you're having a great week and I'll talk to you tomorrow.